Um, but yeah, let's uh, switch the floor now to Miles Berry. Uh, let me spotlight him. Hopefully you can see me and hear me. Perfect, yes. Good, good. Right, okay, we'll do the screen share thing. Uh, um, probably that one. Okay, some slides have appeared, I hope. <laughs> All right. I will not be paying much attention into the chat, so look, unmute and interrupt rather than hoping that I'm going to spot the, the comments over on the side there. Hi, Raymond. I spotted that one at the very least. Right. So the, I'm not going to cover 20 things to do with a computer inside 20 minutes. I picked five of these lovely 20 ideas. I'll explain about the history of it in a little while's time. The essential thesis of the next 20 minutes is the stuff that Seymour Papert and Cynthia Solomon wrote 50 odd years ago is still just as relevant now as it was then for structuring an elementary, middle school, introductory programming course for children. So let's have a look at what this might look like. Next slide, please. There we go. So all of this is based on Papert's idea of people learn best through making things to show to others. We have technical terms there like constructionism of this notion of we're building a mental model of how the world around us works. And, you know, he was working with Piaget, who said you do that through experiment. The child is lone scientist. We nod in the direction of Vygotsky and we say we learn through conversation with others. But Papert, and in this case, Harold's insight was that you learn this best through making things, ideally to show to other people. Anybody who's made a SNAP project will have direct experience of that. And you know, given the whole tie thing that we should be doing now, the chance of sharing that with others and working with others on that, I think is really important. Mitch puts it beautifully well. You make something in the world to make something in your head. Yes, you have this idea, but it's only through giving that some sort of, I wouldn't say physical, but tangible expression that you really get to grips with what those ideas mean. And it's by sharing that with other people that you have a conversation about that and you tweak your ideas and you improve your ideas because of that sense of sharing it. So this is the, this is the paper that starts it all. Look at the date at the top right. Look at the fact that this is typed out on that sort of you know, old fashioned technology. This is June 1971. This was written 51 years ago. So Papert and Solomon say when people talk about computers, they do not all have the same thing in mind. Still true. Some think of using the computer to program the kid. I wonder how much we still do that, even in programming education. Click this block, click this block, snap them together like that. That's not so much teaching a child to program as getting the child to follow instructions. But Papert and Solomon observed that so much of what was happening then was actually about just numbers and text on screen rather than much more meaningful media. So, so many of the ideas in this paper are about media much, much richer than words and um, numbers. So let's start with one of the really introductory ideas there. And I think this, this links back very well to Marie's presentation and what we've seen already in terms of tune scope here and this notion of making music. And I think this is a great introduction. So idea 11 on Papert and Solomon's list of 20 things is make a music, music box and program a tune. Notice, please, that it's not just here are loads of notes, play them in this order. Already by this point, they're introducing what we might now still think of as quite subtle ideas of user defined procedures. So they're breaking up this this tune, this familiar song here. <laughs> Stare into the camera there. Um, breaking up this song here in terms of the, the separate phrases that make this up, each of those defined as a procedure. And then we have a master program which runs that and, and, and plays this. And it's really interesting in terms of how TuneScope is coping with music, that they've gone for two lists here, one of the pitch and another of the duration. Very interesting approach to how you would code music when you're making a machine do that with children. So what does this look like in Snap? Well, something like this. This is why it took me a little while longer to do the screen share, because on a good day, you should be able to get the audio for this. OK, so we've got an honor of, um, OK, um, Stacey, it should be. HTTP colon slash slash. Oops, I'm not typing correctly. B. 
bit.ly slash snapcon22. If that doesn't work, um, I'll have to look back at my slide. Right, where were we? So, <laughs> okay, we've got here user-defined procedures, our own blocks, just as Papert and Solomon did in theirs. So Frere one is this phrase, fingers crossed folks that the audio sharing works. Are you ready for this? And you can tell where I'm going to go next with this. So once we've played that phrase, we can broadcast a message to another sprite. We can broadcast a message to another sprite. We can broadcast a message to another sprite, all of which are sharing exactly the same um, user-defined blocks here. So fingers crossed. And Jens, I love Snap very, very much, but it does sound a lot better in TuneScope. Nick some of their instruments, bring it into the main platform here, please. But I love that sort of 1971 vibe you've got with the sort of very basic synthesizers going on in here. Where next? So the thing that Papert is most famous for, that Logo, the language that he and others created, is this notion of the turtle graphic. And we've, we've heard already about this. Jens is lovely demonstration of turtle graphics to do those cipher wheels. So, so impressed with that, by the way. And I think the lovely thing about turtle geometry is it makes it very, very easy for the, the learner, I was gonna say child, but any learner, to put themselves in the place of the turtle. We talk about this notion of the notional machine, of being able to interpret the code yourself, to read the program and know what the computer will do. And I think that's really apparent when it comes to working inside turtle graphics, that we get to actually physically put ourselves in the place of the turtle and just, okay, thank you, Simon, and just walk through the sides of the square or the sides of the thing that we're, we're trying to code here. It's interesting that Papert and Solomon's introduction to a turtle graphic starts at, I think, a really, really high level. So yes, we have, you know, the classic example of how do you draw an equilateral triangle here, something which we at Roehampton still set as an exercise for new entrants to our PGC course. You would perhaps be amazed how many of them think that the magic angle for an equilateral triangle is 60 degrees, because they've always been told it's 60 degrees for an equilateral triangle. Anyhow, there's, there's Papert and Solomon's equilateral triangle. But notice their procedure for this. Yes, they're defining a procedure to do this, but it's a general procedure rather than the specific one for a square, which is where we typically start. It goes forward, it turns left through an angle, and then it calls itself again. They're introducing recursion here, right there in you know, big idea six of their 20 things to do with a computer. This is for elementary school kids are introduced not to repetition, a certain number of times, but to a procedure which calls itself. <laughs> yes, absolutely, Dan. So, you know, why? How? Do, what does this look like in Snap? Well, there are lots of advantages to doing turtle graphics in Snap rather than good old fashioned logo. Firstly, it's Snap. There's no syntax to learn. It's obvious what a block does. You can find the blocks that you're looking for. You've got the language packs available. You can share it with plenty of other people and you can integrate it with all of those other tools. As far as I can tell, well, there's just one thing which Snap isn't brilliant at when it comes to turtle graphics, which is that the spikes, sprites teleport to where they end up. There's no sense of it moving. And if we want the, the child, the learner, to put themselves in place of a turtle, then that sense of walking along a hundred steps, I think, is kind of part of the, the process there. But look, we can build our own blocks. That's kind of the point, isn't it? So if we want to go forward slowly or turn left slowly, we can make a block to do this. And after a little while of hacking around and trying to get things that work, this seems to do the job there with a variable speed which we could set. So with a little bit of luck, I've got this set up. You can see here are the blocks that I've created here. So what might we do first? Well, the usual one we start with is drawing a square. So we might go forward 100 steps. We might turn left through 90 degrees. It's really interesting that Papert and Solomon went for turning to the left 
here in England at the moment, everything seems to be turning to the right. I'm not sure what's happening in your countries. Let's try this. And we get one side of our square. Typically, we'll introduce that as do that four times, but of course, then we would go very quickly to popping a repeating loop around part of that. Come on, never drags into exactly the place you want it. You ought to know by now. Repeat four times and Oh, I should have cleared the screen at the just before I put the pen down. Let me fix that now. OK, part, point in direction. OK, so we get the square out of it. What do you do next? Typically, in too many programming lessons, what we do next is let's draw a regular hexagon. How exciting is that going to be? Were you getting a bit bored with speed two? Let's speed it up a bit. Oh, we've got a regular hexagon. And then, you know, the most advanced, what about a regular pentagon or indeed that equilateral triangle stuff that we started with earlier? I think that's missing the point here. We have a wonderful opportunity to open this up and make something a lot more creative around it. Let's pop another loop around that. So let's repeat something 10 times and again, turn to the left through an angle at some point. So what, I mean, we could just pick a number here, 67 degrees. What's the worst that could happen? Well, it's okay, isn't it? It is going on a bit. But it's not exact, I mean, it's fine. I mean, this idea of playing with this, I think is so, important. Of course, if we picked exactly the right number, 36 degrees, let's make this 10 times as fast now. We get something which has more symmetry to it. Is symmetry essential for beauty? Discuss in the chat if you'd like to, and we can just uh, not move this around a little after each side. Let's not go for 50. Let's try 25 there. Let's run this one. More or less beautiful. I don't know. It's, it's, it's lost some of its symmetry, but it's got more complexity to it. And I, this idea of starting with something as simple as this mathematically and then getting into a really interesting aesthetic realm. I would personally keep it in black and white as very simple graphics. If you introduce the color um, palette too early, then you end up with everybody just faffing around, mucking around with the colors. That may be an aesthetic decision, too. I then would set challenges. So you've seen a couple of these already. We can take this further. And then we get into some really interesting challenges, which is where Papert and Solomon took us to next with item seven on their list of 20 things, which is this idea of the spiral or the squareal, I think they call it at various points. So again, we've got this idea of a recursive procedure going on here, a procedure which calls itself. Now, there's an issue with these functions, so these procedural definitions, this approach to recursion. I'm surprised nobody's mentioned it in the I chat. I was about Ready? to. Sorry? I was about to. Go on, I say, say, please. The recursive calls terminate. Well, no, they don't. You know, they just keep okay. going forever. Yeah, you know, we're running <laughs> this on SAP servers somewhere. You know, we're going to just end up using all of their compute resources. So, you know, implementing this in SNAP. You've got to wonder what could possibly go wrong with this. So uh, let's have a look at this. Here's um, it's more interesting in the case of the poly spiral. So let's just do the triangle, um, it, starting with size five here, increasing by step size five each time. What's going to happen? Is there anybody who knows what will happen when we run this this, this particular procedure in um, Snap? Let's um, let me show you my polyspy definition. Um, edit. There you go. So it's purely recursive. There is no end case to this. I was okay. going to guess that it kind of winds out and comes back in again. Or something. <laughs> okay, I so I said, I'm going to have to switch my computer off and back on again. Right, let's run the code. <laughs> have a look at this. Okay, here we go. The call ends, then you'll know why. It fails beautifully. It's still running. You know, we've got a lovely green glow around the code there, but it's it's just carried on out into the world somewhere. There's a turtle up the wall of my sitting dining room at the moment. So it fails in a very elegant sort of way. You could say it doesn't even fail. What we need to do, of course, is go back into our definition of um, 
the poly spy here and actually pop in some sort of control structure which says only do this if we are actually on the screen so i've as well as the other things written in a little just test whether it's on screen thing here which should stop when we get to the edge of the world as we know it rather than disappearing off and finding the turtles and all of the rest um, it's turtles all the way down there we go and stops elegantly when we reach the edge of the world it would be nice if we had that block built in but you, know, you can do it yourself okay yes absolutely yes I, I, as a logo a control c in logo i don't know i think it predates that sort of interface or at least some of it predates that okay um where does uh, other things there in papert and solomon's work how are we doing for time right so they talk then about the you know the whole way technology was being used or computers were being used in school back in 1971 50 odd years ago was children doing drill and practice tests the computer asks a question the child types their answer in or possibly select something on the device of their choice okay thank you gents um how things have changed in the intervening 51 years we never use technology in school for something as mundane as drill and practice tests now would we okay so their the lovely example is this and again notice this is infinite recursion random sum includes a call to random sum itself and of course they say a slight modification of this has the notion of the, the computer asking the child the question there and the user i'm interested that papert and solomon refer to their user as the victim. And I think this says a lot about the idea of user interface design. And I think that's carried on over the intervening years. So, you know, if you type in E-L-E-V-E-O-N, of course it doesn't match. And so, idiot, the answer is 11. And typically, um, because I'm running out of time, I'm not going to do the live coding anymore. You know, we build this up, or I would build this up. Okay, thank you. Bit at a time, or line at a time. Start with one question. What is six times eight? And then introduce the idea of the computer creating a question. I was there observing one of my students and just this moment of awe and wonder when one of the pupils realized the computer could make up the question itself was just such a joy to behold. And you, of course, you then get the machine saying whether the answer is right or wrong. Um, this think again, you know, I, my Roehampton students say you can't just tell them, no, it's wrong got to be more encouraging. I remember doing some work out in Singapore where one of the teachers said, had there in their version, why are you so stupid? Which I think is close to Papert and Solomon's idiot in there. And this idea that the best use of computer-aided instruction in school is not getting the computer to ask the child lots of questions, but getting the child to write a program that does this, the sort of quiz program that we were talking about earlier. Um, one of the ideas in Papert and Solomon's book is this idea of growing flowers, and they have this lovely sort of quarter circle idea. Where would this go now? What would you do with this now? Well, of course, because we have blocks that call themselves, because we have this idea of recursion. And notice I have introduced an end condition to the recursion here. We've got the opportunity to, to create fractals using this. The prim here is a way which we're typically using to teach a lot of programming here in England, which is predict, run, investigate, modify, make. So your first question to the class is, what's this going to do? And you want the children to get up out of their chair and act as the turtle trying to trace this out. And doing that for a recursive program is really very, very hard. Thank you, Victoria. Um, doing that and then in run the code and see what happens when it, it's, it's run. I think this is the one here. So click on the green flag, run the code, see what happens. Okay, this is at speed 1000. We can of course turn on the really amazing turbo mode. And so my tree definition here is something that I could hack. Um, let's edit that. So at the moment it's, it's um, not entirely symmetric. I could do 30 degrees here. I could do 15 degrees here. Let's have the same number in both blocks. And you should get a symmetric tree. It's really very dull, isn't it? What's really interesting is if you muck around with the numbers here. So instead of 30, let's have 32 degrees and maybe 0.7. And can you predict what this is going to do? 
And again, green flash here. Whoa! And suddenly we get chaos out of it, and we could do more and more fractals. Um, so I guess that is me pretty much out of time. What was I going to show you? I was going to show you more fractals, I'm going to talk about game programming. There's this lovely anecdote here of getting the children to come into MIT and play Space War. And do you not think things, this technology stuff would be so much better if we had circular screens these days? I'm sure there would be a lot for it. And we were going to then just round up by talking about the relationship between programming and thinking and computational thinking. But I am out of time. Those of you who've got, let me see if I can get the last slide on, which has the link to the slides there. Here you go, bit.ly. Snapcon 2022, um, which will give you links to the projects and some of the supporting work. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry I've et into the next person's time.